Three. Every afternoon at four, after the last of his classes and before the first of his chores, he had a free period of an hour, but on Wednesdays, he was given two hours. Once, he had spent those afternoons reading or exploring the grounds, but recently, ever since Brother Luke had told him he could, he had spent them all at the greenhouse. If Luke was there, he would help the brother water the plants, memorizing their names. Miltonia spectabilis, Alocasia amazonica, Assistacia congetica, so he could repeat them back to the brother and be praised. I think Heliconia velerica has grown, he'd say, petting its furred bracts, and Brother Luke would look at him and shake his head. Unbelievable, he'd say. My goodness, what a great memory you have. And he'd smile to himself, proud to have impressed the brother. If Brother Luke wasn't there, he instead passed the time playing with his things. The brother had shown him how if he moved aside a stack of plastic planners in the far corner of the room, there was a small grate, and if he removed the grate, there was a small hole beneath, big enough to hold a plastic garbage bag of his possessions. So he had unearthed his twigs and stones from under the tree and moved his hall to the greenhouse, where it was warm and humid, and where he could examine his objects without losing feeling in his hands. Over the months, Luke had added to his collection. He gave him a wafer of sea glass that the brother said was the color of his eyes, and a metal whistle that had a round little ball within it that jingled like a bell when you shook it, and a small cloth doll of a man wearing a woolen burgundy top and a belt trimmed with tiny turquoise-colored beads that the brother said had been made by a Navajo Indian and had been his when he was a boy. Two months ago, he had opened his bag and discovered that Luke had left him a candy cane, and although it had been February, he had been thrilled. He had always wanted to taste a candy cane, and he broke it into sections, sucking each into a spare point before biting down on it, gnashing the sugar into his molars. The brother had told him that the next day he had to make sure to come right away as soon as classes ended, because he had a surprise for him. All day he had been antsy and distracted, and although two of the brothers had hit him, Michael across the face, Peter across the backside, he had barely noticed. Only Brother David's warning— that he would be made to do extra chores instead of having his free hours if he didn't start concentrating, made him focus, and somehow he finished the day. As soon as he was outside, out of the view of the monastery building, he ran. It was spring, and he couldn't help but feel happy. He loved the cherry trees, with their froth of pink blossoms, and the tulips, their glossed, improbable colors, and the new grass, soft and tender beneath him. Sometimes, when he was alone, he would take the Navajo doll and a twig he had found that was shaped like a person outside and sit on the grass and play with them. He made up voices for them both, whispering to himself because Brother Michael had said that boys didn't play with dolls and that he was getting too old to play anyway. He wondered if Brother Luke was watching him run. One Wednesday, Brother Luke had said, I saw you running up here today. And as he was opening his mouth to apologize, the brother had continued, Boy, what a great runner you are. You're so fast and he had been literally speechless until the brother, laughing, told him he should close his mouth. When he stepped inside the greenhouse, there was no one there. Hello? He called out. Brother Luke? In here, he heard, and he turned toward the little room that was upended to the greenhouse, the one stocked with the supplies of fertilizer and bottles of ionized water and a hanging rack of clippers and shears and gardening scissors and the floor stacked with bags of mulch. He liked this room, with its woodsy, mossy smell, and he went toward it eagerly and knocked. When he walked in, he was at first disoriented. The room was dark and still, but for a small flame that Brother Luke was bent over on the floor. Come closer, said the brother, and he did. Closer, the brother said, and laughed. Ah, Jude, it's okay. So he went closer, and the brother held something up and said, Surprise! And he saw it was a muffin a muffin with a lit wooden match thrust into its center. What is it? He asked. It's your birthday, right? Asked the brother. And this is your birthday cake. Go on, make a wish. Blow out the candle. It's for me? He asked as the flame guttered. Yes, it's for you, said the brother. Hurry, make a wish. He had never had a birthday cake before, but he had read about them and he knew what to do. He shut his eyes and wished, and then opened them and blew out the match, and the room went completely dark. Congratulations, Luke said, and turned on the light. He handed him the muffin, and when he tried to offer the brother some of it, Luke shook his head. It's yours. 
He ate the muffin which had little blueberries, and which he thought was the best thing he had ever tasted, so sweet and cakey, and the brother watched him and smiled. "'And I have something else for you,' said Luke, and reached behind him and handed him a package, a large flat box wrapped in newspaper and tied with string. "'Go on, open it,' Luke said, and he did, removing the newspaper carefully so it could be reused. The box was plain faded cardboard, and when he opened it, he found it contained an assortment of round pieces of wood. Each piece was notched on both ends, and Brother Luke showed him how the pieces could be slotted within one another to build boxes, and then how he could lay twigs across the top to make a sort of roof. Many years later, when he was in college, he would see a box of these logs in the window of a toy store, and would realize that his gift had been missing parts, a red peak triangular structure to build a roof, and the flat green planks that lay across it. But in the moment, it had left him mute with joy until he had remembered his manners and thanked the brother again and again. "'You're welcome,' said Luke. "'After all, you don't turn eight every day, do you?' "'No,' he admitted, smiling wildly at the gift, and for the rest of his free period, he had built houses and boxes with the pieces while Brother Luke watched him, sometimes reaching over to tuck his hair behind his ears. He spent every minute he could with the brother in the greenhouse. With Luke, he was a different person. To the other brothers, he was a burden, a collection of problems and deficiencies, and every day brought a new detailing of what was wrong with him. He was too dreamy, too emotional, too energetic, too fanciful, too curious, too impatient, too skinny, too playful. He should be more grateful, more graceful, more controlled, more respectful, more patient, more dexterous, more disciplined, more reverent. But to Brother Luke, he was smart, he was quick, he was clever. He was lively. Brother Luke never told him he asked too many questions, or told him that there were certain things he would have to wait to know until he grew up. The first time Brother Luke tickled him, he had gasped and then laughed, uncontrollably, and Brother Luke had laughed with him, the two of them tussling on the floor beneath the orchards. You have such a lovely laugh, Brother Luke said, and, What a great smile you have, Jude, and, What a joyful person you are until it was as if the greenhouse was some place bewitched, somewhere that transformed him into the boy Brother Luke saw, someone funny and bright, someone people wanted to be around, someone better and different than he actually was. When things were bad with the other brothers, he imagined himself in the greenhouse, playing with his things or talking to Brother Luke, and repeated back to himself the things Brother Luke said to him. Sometimes things were so bad he wasn't able to go to dinner, but the next day, he would always find something in his room that Brother Luke had left for him, a flower, or a red leaf, or a particularly bulbous acorn, which he had begun collecting and storing under the grate. The other brothers had noticed he was spending all his time with Brother Luke and, he sensed, disapproved. "'Be careful around Luke,' warned Brother Pavel of all people, Brother Pavel who hit him and yelled at him. "'He's not who you think he is.' But he ignored him. They were none of them who they said they were. One day he went to the greenhouse late. It had been a very hard week. He had been beaten very badly. It hurt him to walk. He had been visited by both Father Gabriel and Brother Matthew the previous evening, and every muscle hurt. It was a Friday. Brother Michael had unexpectedly released him early that day, and he had thought he might go play with his logs. As he always did after those sessions, he wanted to be alone. He wanted to sit in that warm space with his toys and pretend he was far away. No one was in the greenhouse when he arrived, and he lifted the grate and took out his Indian doll and the box of logs. But even as he was playing with them, he found himself crying. He was trying to cry less. It always made him feel worse, and the brothers hated it and punished him for it. But he couldn't help himself. He had at least learned to cry silently, and so he did. Although the problem with crying silently was that it hurt and it took all your concentration, and eventually he had to put his toys down. He stayed until the first bell rang, and then put his things away and ran back downhill toward the kitchen, where he would peel carrots and potatoes and chop celery for the night's meal. And then, for reasons he was never able to determine, not even when he was an adult, things suddenly became very bad. The beatings got worse, the sessions got worse, the lectures got worse. He wasn't sure what he had done. To himself, he seemed the same as he always had, but it was as if the brothers' collective patience with him were reaching some sort of end. Even brothers David and Peter, who loaned him books, as many as he wanted, seemed less inclined to speak to him. 
Go away, Jude, said Brother David, when he came to talk to him about a book of Greek myths the brother had given him. I don't want to look at you now. Increasingly, he was becoming convinced that they were going to get rid of him, and he was terrified, because the monastery was the only home he had ever had. How would he survive? What would he do, in the outside world, which the brothers had told him was full of dangers and temptations? He could work, he knew that. He knew how to garden, and how to cook, and how to clean. Maybe he could get a job doing one of those things. Maybe someone else might take him in. If that happened, he reassured himself he would be better. He wouldn't make any of the mistakes he had made with the brothers. Do you know how much it costs to take care of you? Brother Michael had asked him one day. I don't think we ever thought we'd have you around for this long. He hadn't known what to say to either of those statements, and so had sat staring dumbly at the desk. You should apologize, Brother Michael told him. I'm sorry, he whispered. Now he was so tired that he didn't have strength even to go to the greenhouse. Now after his classes he went down to a corner of the cellar, where Brother Pavel had told him there were rats, but Brother Matthew said there weren't, and climbed onto one of the wire storage units where the boxes of oil and pasta and sacks of flour were stored, and rested, waiting until the bell rang and he had to go back upstairs. At dinners, he avoided Brother Luke, and when the brother smiled at him, he turned away. He knew for certain now that he wasn't the boy Brother Luke thought he was. Joyful? Funny? And he was ashamed of himself, of how he had deceived Luke, somehow. He had been avoiding Luke for a little more than a week when one day he went down to his hiding place and saw the brother there, waiting for him. He looked for somewhere to hide, but there was nowhere, and instead he began to cry, turning his face to the wall and apologizing as he did. Jude, it's all right, said Brother Luke, and stood near him, patting him on the back. It's all right, it's all right. The brother sat on the cellar steps. Come here, come sit next to me, he said, but he shook his head, too embarrassed to do so. Then at least sit down, said Luke, and he did, leaning against the wall. Luke stood, then, and began looking through the boxes on one of the high shelves until he retrieved something from one and held it out to him, a glass bottle of apple juice. I can't, he said, instantly. He wasn't supposed to be in the cellar at all. He entered it through the small window on the side and then climbed down the wire shelves. Brother Powell was in charge of the stores and counted them every week. If something was missing, he'd be blamed. He always was. Don't worry, Jude, said the brother. I'll replace it. Go on. Take it. And finally, after some coaxing, he did. The juice was sweet as syrup, and he was torn between sipping it to make it last and gulping it, in case the brother changed his mind and it was taken from him. After he had finished, they sat in silence, and then the brother said, in a low voice, Jude, what they do to you, it's not right. They shouldn't be doing that to you. They shouldn't be hurting you. And he almost started crying again. I would never hurt you, Jude. You know that, don't you? And he was able to look at Luke, at his long, kind, worried face, with his short gray beard and his glasses that made his eyes look even larger, and nod. I know, Brother Luke, he said. Brother Luke was quiet for a long time before he spoke next. Do you know, Jude, that before I came here to the monastery, I had a son? You remind me so much of him. I loved him so much, but he died, and then I came here. He didn't know what to say, but he didn't have to say anything, it seemed, because Brother Luke kept talking. I look at you sometimes, and I think, you don't deserve to have these things happen to you. You deserve to be with someone else, someone... And then Brother Luke stopped, again, because he had begun to cry again. Jude, he said, surprised. Don't, he sobbed. Please, Brother Luke, don't let them send me away. I'll be better. I promise. I promise. Don't let them send me away. Jude, said the brother, and sat down next to him, pulling him into his body. No one's sending you away. I promise. No one's going to send you away. Finally, he was able to calm himself again, and the two of them sat silent for a long time. All I meant to say was that you deserve to be with someone who loves you, like me. If you were with me, I'd never hurt you. We'd have such a wonderful time. What would we do? He asked, finally. Well, said Luke, slowly. We could go camping. Have you ever been camping? He hadn't, 
of course, and Luke told him about it. The tent, the fire, the smell and snap of burning pine, the marshmallows impaled on sticks, the owl's hoots. The next day he returned to the greenhouse, and over the following weeks and months, Luke would tell him about all the things they might do together, on their own. They would go to the beach, and to the city, and to a fair. He would have pizza, and hamburgers, and corn on the cob, and ice cream. He would learn how to play baseball, and how to fish, and they would live in the little cabin, just the two of them, like father and son, and all morning long they would read, and all afternoon they would play. They would have a garden where they would grow all their vegetables, and flowers, too, and yes, maybe they'd have a greenhouse some day as well. They would do everything together, go everywhere together, and they would be like best friends, only better. He was intoxicated by Luke's stories, and when things were awful, he thought of them. The garden where they'd grow pumpkins and squash, the creek that ran behind the house where they'd catch perch, the cabin, a larger version of the ones he built with his logs, where Luke promised him he would have a real bed, and where even the coldest of nights, they would always be warm, and where they could bake muffins every week. One afternoon, it was early January, and so cold they had to wrap all greenhouse plants in burlap despite the heaters. They had been working in silence. He could always tell when Luke wanted to talk about their house and when he didn't. And he knew that today was one of his quiet days, when the brothers seemed elsewhere. Brother Luke was never unkind when he was in these moods, only quiet. But the kind of quiet he knew to avoid. But he yearned for one of Luke's stories. He needed it. It had been such an awful day, the kind of day in which he wanted to die. And he wanted to hear Luke tell him about their cabin and about all the things they would do there when they were alone. In their cabin, there would be no brother Matthew or father Gabriel or brother Peter. No one would shout at him or hurt him. It would be like living all the time in the greenhouse, an enchantment without end. He was reminding himself not to speak when brother Luke spoke to him. Jude, he said, I'm very sad today. Why, brother Luke? Well, said brother Luke and paused. You know how much I care for you, right? But lately I've been feeling that you don't care for me. This was terrible to hear, and for a moment he couldn't speak. That's not true, he told the brother. But Brother Luke shook his head. I keep talking to you about our house in the forest, he said. But I don't get the feeling that you really want to go there. To you, they're just stories, like fairy tales. He shook his head. No, Brother Luke, they're real to me, too. He wished he could tell Brother Luke just how real they were, just how much he needed them, how much they had helped him. Brother Luke looked so upset, but finally he was able to convince him that he wanted that life, too, that he wanted to live with Brother Luke and no one else, that he would do whatever he needed to in order to have it. And finally, finally, the brother had smiled, and crouched and hugged him, moving his arms up and down his back. Thank you, Jude, thank you, he said, and he, so happy to have made Brother Luke so happy, thanked him back. And then Brother Luke looked at him, suddenly serious. He had been thinking about it a lot, he said, and he thought it was time for them to build their cabin. It was time that they go away together. But he, Luke, wouldn't do it alone. Was Jude going to come with him? Did he give him his word? Did he want to be with Brother Luke the way Brother Luke wanted to be with him, just the two of them in their small and perfect world? And of course he did. Of course he did. So there was a plan. They would leave in two months, before Easter. He would celebrate his ninth birthday in their cabin. Brother Luke would take care of everything. All he needed to do was be a good boy, and study hard, and not cause any problems. And, most important, say nothing. If they found out what they were doing, Brother Luke said, then he would be sent away, away from the monastery, to make his way on his own, and Brother Luke wouldn't be able to help him then. He promised. The next two months were terrible and wonderful at the same time. Terrible because they passed so slowly. Wonderful because he had a secret. One that made his life better. Because it meant his life in the monastery had an end. Every day he woke up eager. Because it meant he was one day closer to being with Brother Luke. Every time one of the brothers was with him, he would remember that soon he would be far away from them. And it would be a little less bad. Every time he was beaten or yelled at, he would imagine himself in the cabin. And it would give him the fortitude a word Brother Luke had taught him, to withstand it. He had begged Brother Luke to let him help with the preparations, and Brother Luke had told him to gather a sample of every flower and leaf from all the different kinds of plants on the monastery grounds, 
and so in the afternoons he prowled the property with his Bible, pressing leaves and petals between its pages. He spent less time in the greenhouse, but whenever he saw Luke, the brother would give him one of his somber winks, and he would smile to himself, their secret something warm and delicious. The night finally arrived, and he was nervous. Brother Matthew was with him in the early evening, right after dinner, but eventually he left, and he was alone. And then there was Brother Luke, holding his finger pressed to his lips, and he nodded. He helped Luke load his books and underwear into the paper bag he held open, and then they were tiptoeing down the hallway, and down the stairs, and then through the darkened building and into the night. There's just a short walk to the car, Luke whispered to him, and then, when he stopped, Jude, what's wrong? My bag, he said. My bag from the greenhouse. And then Luke smiled his kind smile and put his hand on his head. I put it in the car already, he said and smiled back, so grateful to Luke for remembering. The air was cold, but he hardly noticed. On and on they walked, down the monastery's long gravel driveway and past the wooden gates and up the hill that led to the main road and then down the main road itself, the night so silent it hummed. As they walked, Brother Luke pointed out different constellations and he named them. He got them all right, and Luke murmured in admiration and stroked the back of his head. You're so smart, he said. I'm so glad I picked you, Jude. Now they were on the road, which he had only been on a few times in his life, to go to the doctor or to the dentist, although now it was empty and little animals, muskrats and possums, gambled before them. Then they were at the car, a long maroon station wagon piebald with rust, its back seat filled with boxes and black trash bags and some of Luke's favorite plants, the Cattleya Schilleriana with its ugly speckled petals, the Hyaloceris undatus with its sleepy drooping head of a blossom, in their dark green plastic nests. It was strange to see Brother Luke in a car, stranger than being in the car itself, but stranger than that was the feeling he had, that everything had been worth it, that all his miseries were going to end that he was going to a life that would be as good as, perhaps better than, anything he had read about in books. Are you ready to go? Brother Luke whispered to him, and grinned. I am, he whispered back, and Brother Luke turned a key in the ignition. There were two ways of forgetting. For many years, he had envisioned, unimaginatively, a vault, and at the end of the day, he would gather the images and sequences and words that he didn't want to think about again and open the heavy steel door only enough to hurry them inside, closing it quickly and tightly. But this method wasn't effective. The memory seeped out anyway. The important thing, he came to realize, was to eliminate them, not just to store them. So he had invented some solutions. For small memories, little slights, insults, you relived them again and again until they were neutralized, until they became near meaningless with repetition, or until you could believe that they were something that had happened to someone else and you had just heard about it. For larger memories, you held the scene in your head like a film strip, and then you began to erase it, frame by frame. Neither method was easy. You couldn't stop in the middle of your erasing and examine what you were looking at. For example, you couldn't start scrolling through parts of it and hope you wouldn't be ensnared in the details of what had happened, because of course you would. You had to work at it every night until it was completely gone. Though they never disappeared completely, of course, but they were at least more distant, they weren't things that followed you, wraith-like, tugging at you for attention, jumping in front of you when you ignored them, demanding so much of your time and effort that it became impossible to think of anything else. In follow periods, the moments before you fell asleep, the minutes before you were landing after an overnight flight when you weren't awake enough to do work and weren't tired enough to sleep, they would reassert themselves, and so it was best to imagine, then, a screen of white, huge and light lit and still, and hold it in your mind like a shield. In the weeks following the beating, he worked on forgetting Caleb. Before going to bed, he went to the door of his apartment and, feeling foolish, tried forcing his old set of keys into the locks to assure himself that they didn't fit, that he really was once again safe. He set and reset the alarm system he had installed, which was so sensitive that even passing shadows triggered a flurry of beeps. And then he lay awake, his eyes open in the dark room, concentrating on forgetting. But it was so difficult. There were so many memories from those months that stabbed him that he was overwhelmed. He heard Caleb's voice saying things to him. He saw the expression on Caleb's face as he stared at his unclothed body. He felt the horrid, blank airlessness of his fall down the staircase. 
and he crunched himself into a knot and put his hands over his ears and closed his eyes. Finally, he would get up and go to his office at the other end of the apartment and work. He had a big case coming up, and he was grateful for it. His days were so occupied that he had little time to think of anything else. For a while, he was hardly going home at all, just two hours to sleep and an hour to shower and change, until one evening he'd had an episode at work, a bad one, the first time he ever had. The night janitor had found him on the floor and had called the building security department, who had called the firm's chairman, a man named Peterson Tremaine, who called Lucien, who was the only one he had told what to do in case something like this should happen. Lucien had called Andy, and then both he and the chairman had come into the office and waited with him for Andy to arrive. He had seen them, seen their feet, and even as he had gasped and writhed on the ground, he had tried to find the energy to beg them to leave, to reassure them that he was fine, that he just needed to be left alone. But they hadn't left, and Lucien had wiped the vomit from his mouth, tenderly, and then sat on the floor near his head and held his hand, and he had been so embarrassed he had almost cried. Later, he had told them again and again that it was nothing, that this happened all the time, but they had made him take the rest of the week off, and the following Monday, Lucien had told him that they were making him go home at a reasonable hour, midnight on the weekdays, 9 p.m. on the weekends. Lucien, he'd said, frustrated, this is ridiculous, I'm not a child. Believe me, Jude, Lucien had said. Well, I told the rest of the management committee I thought we should write you like you were an Arabian at the Preakness. For some strange reason, they worried about your health. Also, the case. For some reason, they think if you get sick, we won't win the case. He had fought and fought with Lucien, but it hadn't made a difference. At midnight, his office lights abruptly clicked off, and he had at last resigned himself to going home when he had been told. Since the Caleb incident, he had barely been able to talk to Harold. Even seeing him was a kind of torture. This made Harold and Julia's visits, which were increasingly frequent, challenging. He was mortified that Harold had seen him like that. When he thought of it, Harold seeing his bloody pants, Harold asking him about his childhood. How obvious was he? Could people actually tell by talking to him what had happened to him so many years ago? And if so, how could he better conceal it? He was so sharply nauseated that he had to stop what he was doing and wait for the moment to pass. He could feel Harold trying to treat him the same as he had, but something had shifted. No longer did Harold harass him about Rose and Pritchard. No longer did he ask him what it was like to abet corporate malfeasance. And he certainly never mentioned the possibility that he might settle down with someone. Now his questions were about how he felt. How was he? How was he feeling? How were his likes? Had he been tiring himself out? Had he been using the chair a lot? Did he need help with anything? He always answered the exact same way. Fine. 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 No. 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 And then there was Andy who had abruptly reinitiated his nightly phone calls. Now he called at 1 a.m. every night, and during their appointments, which Andy had increased to every other week, he was un-Andy-ish, quiet and polite, which made him anxious. He examined his legs. He counted his cuts. He asked all the questions he always did. He checked his reflexes. And every time he got home, when he was emptying his pockets of change, he found that Andy had slipped in a card for a doctor, a psychologist named Sam Lowman and on it had written, First Visits on Me. There was always one of these cards, each time with a different note. Do it for me, Jude. Or, one time. That's it. They were like annoying fortune cookies, and he always threw them away. He was touched by the gesture but also wary of it, of its pointlessness. It was the feeling he had whenever he had to replace the bag under the sink after Harold's visits. He'd go to the corner of his closet where he kept a box filled with hundreds of alcohol wipes and bandages stacks and stacks of gauze and dozens of packets of razors and make a new bag and tape it back in its proper place people had always decided how his body would be used and although he knew that harold and andy were trying to help him the childish obdurate part of him resisted he would decide he had such little control of his body anyway how could they begrudge him this he told himself he was fine that he had recovered that he had regained his equilibrium but really he knew something was wrong, that he had been changed, that he was slipping. Willem was home, and even though he hadn't been there to witness what had happened, even though he didn't know about Caleb, about his humiliation, he had made certain of this, telling Harold and Julia and Andy that he'd never speak to them again if they said anything to anyone. He was still somehow ashamed to be seen by him. Jude, I'm so sorry, Willem had said when he had returned and seen his cast. Are you sure you're okay? 
But the cast was nothing. The cast was the least shameful part. And for a minute, he had been tempted to tell Willem the truth. To collapse against him the way he never had and start crying. To confess everything to Willem and ask him to make him feel better. To tell him that he still loved him in spite of who he was. But he didn't, of course. He had already written Willem a long email full of elaborate lies detailing his car accident. And the first night they were reunited, they had stayed up so late talking about everything but the email that Willem had slept over, the two of them falling asleep on the living room sofa. But he kept his life moving along. He got up, he went to work. He simultaneously craved company, so he wouldn't think of Caleb, and dreaded it, because Caleb had reminded him how inhuman he was, how deficient, how disgusting, and he was too embarrassed to be around other people, normal people. He thought of his days the way he thought of taking steps when he was experiencing the pain and numbness in his feet. He would get through one, and then the next, and then the next, and eventually things would get better. Eventually he would learn how to fold those months into his life and accept them and keep going. He always had. The court case came, and he won. It was a huge win, Lucien kept telling him, and he knew it was, but mostly he felt panic. Now, what was he going to do? He had a new client, a bank, but the work there was of the long, tedious, fact-gathering sort, not the kind of frantic work that required 20-hour days. He would be at home, by himself, with nothing but the Caleb incident to occupy his mind. Tremaine congratulated him, and he knew he should be happy, but when he asked the chairman for more work, Tremaine laughed. Oh, St. Francis, he said, you're going on vacation. That's an order. He didn't go on vacation. He promised first Lucien and then Tremaine he would, but that he couldn't at the moment. But it was as he had feared. He would be at home, making himself dinner, or at a movie with Willem, and suddenly a scene from his months with Caleb would appear. And then there would be a scene from the home, and a scene from his years with Brother Luke, and then a scene from his months with Dr. Trailer, and then a scene from the injury, the headlights white glare, his head jerking to the side. And then his mind would fill with images, banshees demanding his attention, snatching and tearing at him with their long, needly fingers. Caleb had unleashed something within him, and he was unable to coax the beasts back into their dungeon. He was made aware of how much time he actually spent controlling his memories, how much concentration it took, how fragile his command over them had been all along. Are you alright? Willem asked him one night. They had seen a play, which he had barely registered, and then had gone out to dinner where he had half listened to Willem, hoping he was making the correct responses as he moved his food around his plate and tried to act normal. Yes, he said. Things were getting worse. He knew it and didn't know how to make it better. It was eight months after the incident, and every day he thought about it more, not less. He felt sometimes as if his months with Caleb were a pack of hyenas, and every day they chased him, and every day he spent all his energy running from them, trying to escape being devoured by their snapping, foaming jaws. All the things that had helped him in the past, the concentrating, the cutting, weren't helping now. He cut himself more and more, but the memories wouldn't disappear. Every morning he swam, and every night he swam again, for miles, until he had energy enough only to shower and climb into his bed. As he swam, he chanted to himself. He conjugated Latin verbs. He recited proofs. He quoted back to himself decisions that he had studied in law school. His mind was his, he told himself. He would control this. He wouldn't be controlled. I have an idea, Willem said at the end of another meal in which he had failed to say much of anything. He had responded a second or two too late to everything Willem had said, and after a while, they were both quiet. We should take a vacation together. We should go on that trip to Morocco we were supposed to take two years ago. We can do it as soon as I get back. What do you think, Jude? It'll be fall, then. It'll be beautiful. It was late June. Nine months after the incident, Willem was leaving again at the beginning of August for a shoot in Sri Lanka. He wouldn't be back until the beginning of October. As Willem spoke, he was thinking of how Caleb had called him deformed, and only Willem's silence had reminded him it was his turn to respond. Sure, Willem, he said. That sounds great. The restaurant was in the Flatiron District, and after they paid, they walked for a while, neither of them saying anything, when suddenly, he saw Caleb coming toward them and in his panic, he grabbed Willem and yanked him into the doorway of a building, startling them both with his strength and swiftness. Jude, Willem said, alarmed, what are you doing? Don't say anything, he whispered to Willem. 
Just stay here and don't turn around. And Willem did, facing the door with him. He counted the seconds until he was certain Caleb must have passed, and then looked cautiously out toward the sidewalk and saw that it hadn't been Caleb at all. Just another tall, dark-haired man, but not Caleb. And he had exhaled, feeling defeated and stupid and relieved all at once. He noticed then that he still had Willem's shirt bunched in his hand, and he released it. Sorry, he said. Sorry, Willem. Jude, what happened? Willem asked, trying to look him in the eyes. What was that? Nothing, he said. I just thought I saw someone I didn't want to see. Who? No one. This lawyer on a case I'm working on. He's a prick. I hate dealing with him. Willem looked at him. No, he said, at last. It wasn't another lawyer. It was someone else. Someone you're scared of. There was a pause. Willem looked down the street and then back at him. You're frightened, he said, his voice wondering. Who was it, Jude? He shook his head, trying to think of a lie he could tell Willem. He was always lying to Willem. Big lies, small lies. Their entire relationship was a lie. Willem thought he was one person, and really, he wasn't. Only Caleb knew the truth. Only Caleb knew what he was. I told you, he said, at last. This is another lawyer. No, it wasn't. Yes, it was. Two women walked by them, and as they passed, he heard one of them whisper excitedly to the other. That's Willem Wagner's son. He closed his eyes. Listen, Willem said, quietly. What's going on with you? Nothing, he said. I'm tired. I need to go home. Fine, Willem said. He held a cab and helped him in and then got in himself. Green and broom, he said to the driver. In the cab, his hands began to shake. This had been happening more and more, and he didn't know how to stop it. It had started when he was a child, but it had happened only in extreme circumstances, when he was trying not to cry, or when he was in extraordinary pain but knew that he couldn't make a sound. But now it happened at strange moments. Only cutting helped, but sometimes the shaking was so severe that he had had difficulty controlling the razor. He crossed his arms against himself and hoped Willem wouldn't notice. At the front door, he tried to get rid of Willem, but Willem wouldn't leave. I want to be alone, he told him. I understand, Willem said. We'll be alone together. They had stood there, facing each other, until he had finally turned to the door, but he couldn't fit the key into the lock because he was shaking so badly, and Willem took the keys from him and opened the door. What the hell is going on with you? Willem asked as soon as they were in the apartment. Nothing, he said. Nothing. And now his teeth were chattering which was something that had never accompanied the shaking when he was young but now happened almost every time. Willem stepped close to him, but he turned his face away. Something happened while I was away, Willem said, tentatively. I don't know what it is, but something happened. Something's wrong. You've been acting strangely ever since I got home from the Odyssey. I don't know why. He stopped and put his hands on his shoulders. Tell me, Jude, he said. Tell me what it is. Tell me and we'll figure out how to make it better. No, he whispered. I can't, Willem, I can't. There was a long silence. I want to go to bed, he said, and Willem released him and he went to the bathroom. When he came out, Willem was wearing one of his t-shirts and was lofting the duvet from the guest room over to the sofa in his bedroom, the sofa under the painting of Willem in the makeup chair. What are you doing? He asked. I'm staying here tonight. Willem said. He sighed, but Willem started talking before he could. You have three choices, Jude, he said. One, I call Andy and tell him I think there's something really going wrong with you and I take you up to his office for an evaluation. Two, I call Harold, who freaks out and calls Andy. Or three, you let me stay here and monitor you because you won't talk to me. You won't fucking tell me anything and you never seem to understand that you at least owe your friends the opportunity to try to help you. You at least owe me that. His voice cracked. So what's it going to be? Oh, Willem, he thought. You don't know how badly I want to tell you. I'm sorry, Willem, he said instead. Fine, you're sorry, said Willem. Go to bed. Do you still have extra toothbrushes in the same place? Yes, he said. The next night he came home late from work and found Willem lying on the sofa in his room again, reading. How was your day? he asked not lowering his book. Fine, 
he said. He waited to see if Willem was going to explain himself, but he didn't, and eventually he went to the bathroom. In the closet, he passed Willem's duffel bag, which was unzipped and filled with enough clothes that it was clear he was going to stay for a while. He felt pathetic admitting it to himself, but having Willem there, not just in his apartment, but in his room, helped. They didn't speak much, but his very presence steadied and refocused him. He thought less of Caleb. He thought less of everything. It was as if the necessity of proving himself normal to Willem really did make him more normal. Just being around someone he knew would never harm him, not ever, was soothing. And he was able to quiet his mind and sleep. As grateful as he was, though, he was also disgusted at himself by how dependent he was, how weak. Was there no end to his needs? How many people had helped him over the years, and why had they? Why had he let them? A better friend would have told Willem to go home, told him he would be fine on his own, but he didn't do this. He let Willem spend the few remaining weeks he had in New York sleeping on his sofa like a dog. At least he didn't have to worry about upsetting Robin, as Willem and Robin had broken up toward the end of the Odyssey shoot, when Robin discovered that Willem had cheated on her with one of the costume assistants. And I didn't even really like her, Willem had told him in one of their phone calls. I did it for the worst reason of all, because I was bored. He had considered this. No, he said. The worst reason of all would have been because you were trying to be cruel. Yours was just the stupidest reason of all. There had been a pause, and then Willem had started laughing. Thanks for that, Jude, he said. Thanks for making me feel both better and worse. Willem stayed with him until the very day he had to leave for Colombo. He was playing the eldest son of a faded Dutch merchant family in Sri Lanka in the early 1940s and had grown a thick mustache that curled up at its tips. When Willem hugged him, he felt it brushing against his ear. For a moment, he wanted to break down and beg Willem not to leave. Don't go, he wanted to tell him. Stay here with me. I'm scared to be alone. He knew that if he did say this, Willem would, or he would at least try. But he would never say this. He knew it would be impossible for Willem to delay the shoot, and he knew that Willem would feel guilty for his inability to do so. Instead, he tightened his hold on Willem, which was something he rarely did. He rarely showed Willem any physical affection, and he could feel that Willem was surprised. But then he increased his pressure as well, and the two of them stood there, wrapped around each other, for a long time. He remembered thinking that he wasn't wearing enough layers to really let Willem hug him this closely, that Willem would be able to feel the scars on his back through his shirt. But in the moment, it was more important to simply be near him. He had the sense that this was the last time this would happen, the last time he would see Willem. He had this fear every time Willem went away, but it was keener this time, less theoretical. It felt more like a real departure. After Willem left, things were fine for a few days, but then they got bad again. The hyenas returned, more numerous and famished than before, more vigilant in their hunt. And then everything else returned as well. Years and years and years of memories he had thought he had controlled and defanged, all crowding him once again, yelping and leaping before his face, unignorable in their sounds, indefatigable in their clamor for his attention. He woke gasping for air. He woke with the names of people he had sworn he would never think of again on his tongue. He replayed the night with Caleb again and again, obsessively, the memory slowing so that seconds he was standing naked in the rain on Green Street stretched into hours, so that his flight down the stairs took days, so that Caleb's raping him in the shower, in the elevator, took weeks. He had visions of taking an ice pick and jamming it through his ear, into his brain, to stop the memories. He dreamed of slamming his head against the wall until it split and cracked and the gray meat tumbled out with a wet, bloody thunk. He had fantasies of emptying a container of gasoline over himself and then striking a match, of his mind being gobbled by fire. He bought a set of exacto blades and held the three of them in his palm and made a fist around them and watched the blood drip from his hand into the sink as he screamed into the quiet apartment. He asked Lucienne for more work and was given it, but it wasn't enough. He tried to volunteer for more hours at the artist's nonprofit, but they didn't have any additional shifts to give him. He tried to volunteer at a place where Rhodes had once done some pro bono work, an immigrants' rights organization, but they said they were really looking for Mandarin and Arabic speakers at the moment and didn't want to waste his time. He cut himself more and more. He began cutting around the scars themselves, so that he could actually remove wedges of flesh, each piece topped with a silvery sheen of scar tissue, but it didn't help, not enough. At night, he prayed to a god he didn't believe in, and hadn't for years. Help me. 
help me, help me, he pleaded. He was losing himself. This had to stop. He couldn't keep running forever. It was August. The city was empty. Malcolm was in Sweden on holiday with Sophie. Richard was in Capri. Rhodes was in Maine. Andy was on Shelter Island. Remember, he'd said before he left, as he always said before a long vacation, I'm just two hours away. You need me, and I catch the ferry back. He couldn't bear to be around Harold, whom he couldn't see without being reminded of his debasement. He called and told him he had too much work to go to Truro. Instead, he spontaneously bought a ticket to Paris and spent the long, lonely Labor Day weekend there, wandering the streets by himself. He didn't contact anyone he knew there, not Citizen, who was working for a French bank, or Isidore, his upstairs neighbor from Hereford Street, who was teaching there, or Phaedra, who had taken a job as the director of a satellite of a New York gallery. They wouldn't have been in the city anyway. He was tired. He was so tired. It was taking so much energy to hold the beasts off. He sometimes had an image of himself surrendering to them, and they would cover him with their claws and beaks and talons and peck and pinch and pluck away at him until he was nothing, and he would let them. After he returned from Paris, he had a dream in which he was running across a cracked reddish plain of earth. Behind him was a dark cloud, and although he was fast, the cloud was faster. As it drew closer, he heard a buzzing and realized it was a swarm of insects, terrible and oily and noisy with pincer-like protuberances jutting out from beneath their eyes. He knew that if he stopped, he would die, and yet even in the dream he knew he couldn't go on for much longer. At some point, he had stopped being able to run and had started hobbling instead, reality asserting itself even in his dreams. And then he heard a voice, one unfamiliar but calm and authoritative, speak to him. Stop, it said. You can end this. You don't have to do this. It was such a relief to hear those words. And he stopped, abruptly, and faced the cloud, which was seconds, feet away from him, exhausted and waiting for it to be over. He woke, frightened, because he knew what the words meant, and they both terrified and comforted him. Now, as he moved through his days, he heard that voice in his head, and he was reminded that he could, in fact, stop. He didn't, in fact, have to keep going. He had considered killing himself before, of course, when he was in the home, and in Philadelphia, and after Anna had died. But something had always stopped him, although now he couldn't remember what that thing had been. Now as he ran from the hyenas, he argued with himself. Why was he doing this? He was so tired. He so wanted to stop. Knowing that he didn't have to keep going was a solace to him, somehow. It reminded him that he had options. It reminded him that even though his subconscious wouldn't obey his conscious, it didn't mean he was still in control. Almost as an experiment, he began thinking of what it would mean for him to leave. In January, after his most lucrative year at the firm yet, he had updated his will so that it was in order. He would need to write a letter to Willem, a letter to Harold, a letter to Julia. He would also want to write something to Lucienne, to Richard, to Malcolm, to Andy, to JB, forgiving him. Then he could go. Every day, he thought about it, and thinking about it made things easier. Thinking about it gave him fortitude. And then, at some point, it was no longer an experiment. He couldn't remember how he had decided, but after he had, he felt lighter, freer, less tormented. The hyenas were still chasing him, but now he could see, very far in the distance, a house with an open door, and he knew that once he had reached that house, he would be safe, and everything that pursued him would fall away. They didn't like it, of course. They could see the door as well. They knew he was about to elude them. And every day the hunt got worse, the army of things chasing him stronger and louder and more insistent. His brain was vomiting memories. They were flooding everything else. He thought of people and sensations and incidents he hadn't thought of in years. Tastes appeared on his tongue as if by alchemy. He smelled fragrances he hadn't smelled in decades. His system was compromised. He would drown in his memories. He had to do something. He had tried. All his life. He had tried. He had tried to be someone different. He had tried to be someone better. He had tried to make himself clean, but it hadn't worked. Once he had decided, he was fascinated by his own hopefulness, by how he could have saved himself years of sorrow by just ending it. He could have been his own savior. No law said he had to keep on living. His life was still his own to do with what he pleased. How had he not realized this in all these years? The choice now seemed obvious. The only question was why it had taken him so long. He talked to Harold. He could tell by the relief in Harold's voice that he must be sounding more normal. He talked to Willem. 
You sound better, Willem said, and he could hear the relief in Willem's voice as well. I am, he said. He felt a pull of regret after talking to both of them, but he was determined. He was no good for them, anyway. He was only an extravagant collection of problems, nothing more. Unless he stopped himself, he would consume them with his needs. He would take and take and take from them until he had chewed away their every bit of flesh. They could answer every difficulty he posed to them, and he would still find new ways to destroy them. For a while, they would mourn him, because they were good people, the best, and he was sorry for that. But eventually they would see that their lives were better without him. They would see how much time he had stolen from them. They would understand what a thief he had been, how he had suckled away all their energy and attention, how he had exsanguinated them. He hoped they would forgive him. He hoped they would see that this was his apology to them. He was releasing them. He loved them most of all. And this was what you did for people you loved. You gave them their freedom. The day came. A Monday at the end of September. The night before he had realized that it was almost exactly a year after the beating, although he hadn't planned it that way. He left work early that evening. He had spent the weekend organizing his projects. He had written Lucien a memo detailing the status of everything he had been working on. At home, he lined up his letters on the dining room table and a copy of his will. He had left a message with Richard's studio manager that the toilet in the master bathroom kept running and asked if Richard could let in the plumber the following day at nine. Both Richard and Willem had a set of keys to his apartment because he would be away on business. He took off his suit and jacket and tie and shoes and watch and went to the bathroom. He sat in the shower area with his sleeves pushed up. He had a glass of scotch, which he sipped at to steady himself, and a box cutter, which he knew would be easier to hold than a razor. He knew what he needed to do. Three straight vertical lines, as deep and long as he could make them, following the veins up both arms. And then he would lie down and wait. He waited for a while, crying a bit, because he was tired and frightened and because he was ready to go. He was ready to leave. Finally, he rubbed his eyes and began. He started with his left arm. He made the first cut, which was more painful than he had thought it would be, and he cried out. Then he made the second. He took another drink of the scotch. The blood was viscous, more gelatinous than liquid, and a brilliant, shimmering oil black. Already his pants were soaked with it. Already his grip was loosening. He made the third. When he was done with both arms, he slumped against the back of the shower wall. He wished, absurdly, for a pillow. He was warm from the scotch and from his own blood, which lapped at his arm as it pulled around his legs, his insides meeting his outsides, the inner bathing the outer. He closed his eyes. Behind him, the hyenas howled, furious at him. Before him stood the house with its open door. He wasn't close yet, but he was closer than he'd been. Close enough to see that inside, there was a bed where he could rest, where he could lie down and sleep after his long run, where he would, for the first time in his life, be safe. After they crossed into Nebraska, Brother Luke stopped at the edge of a wheat field and beckoned him out of the car. It was still dark, but he could hear the birds stirring, hear them talk back to a son they couldn't yet see. He took the brother's hand and they sculled from the car to a large tree where Brother Luke explained that the other brothers would be looking for them and they would have to change their appearance. He took off the hated tunic and put on the clothes Brother Luke held out for him, a sweatshirt with a hood and a pair of jeans. Before he did, though, he stood still as Luke cut off his hair with an electric razor. The brothers rarely cut his hair, and it was long, past his ears, and Brother Luke made sad noises as he removed it. Your beautiful hair, he said, and carefully wrapped the length of it in his tunic and then stuffed it into a garbage bag. You look like every other boy now, Jude. But later, when we're safe, you can grow it back, all right? And he nodded, although really... He liked the idea of looking like every other boy. And then Brother Luke changed clothes himself, and he turned away to give the brother privacy. Oh, you can look, Jude, said Luke, laughing, but he shook his head. When he turned back, the brother was unrecognizable, in a plaid shirt and jeans of his own, and he smiled at him before shaving off his beard, the silvery bristles falling from him like splinters of metal. There were baseball caps for both of them, although the inside of Brother Luke's was fitted with a yellowish wig, which covered his balding head completely. There were pairs of glasses for both of them as well. His were black and round and fitted with just glass, not real lenses, but Brother Luke's were square and large and brown and had the same thick lenses as his real glasses, which he put into the bag. He could take them off when they were safe, Brother Luke told him. They were on their way to Texas, 
which is where they'd build their cabin. He had always imagined Texas's flat land, just dust and sky and road, which Brother Luke said was mostly true, but there were parts of the state, like in East Texas, where he was from, that were forested with spruce and cedars. It took them 19 hours to reach Texas. It would have been less time, but at one point Brother Luke pulled off the side of the highway and said he needed a nap for a while, and the two of them slept for several hours. Brother Luke had packed them something to eat as well, peanut butter sandwiches, and in Oklahoma they stopped again in the parking lot of a rest stop to eat them. The Texas of his mind had, with just a few descriptions from Brother Luke, transformed from a landscape of tumbleweeds and sod into one of pines, so tall and fragrant that they cottoned out all other sound, all other life. So when Brother Luke announced that they were now, officially, in Texas, he looked out the window, disappointed. Where are the forests? he asked. Brother Luke laughed. Patience, Jude. They would need to stay in a motel for a few days, Brother Luke explained, both to make sure the other brothers weren't following them and so he could begin scouting for the perfect place to build their cabin. The motel was called the Golden Hand, and their room had two beds, real beds, and Brother Luke let him choose which one he wanted. He took the one near the bathroom, and Brother Luke took the one near the window, with a view of their car. Why don't you take a shower? I'm going to go to the store and get us some supplies, said the brother, and he was suddenly frightened. What's wrong, Jude? Are you going to come back? he asked, hating how scared he sounded. Of course I will come back, Jude, said the brother, hugging him. Of course I will. When he did, he had a loaf of sliced bread and a jar of peanut butter and a hand of bananas and a quart of milk and a bag of almonds and some onions and peppers and chicken breasts. That evening, Brother Luke set up the small hibachi he'd brought in the parking lot and they grilled the onions and peppers and chicken and Brother Luke gave him a glass of milk. Brother Luke established their routine. They woke early, before the sun was up, and Brother Luke made himself a pot of coffee with the coffee maker he'd brought, and then they drove into town, to the high school's track, where Luke let him run around for an hour as he sat in the bleachers, drinking his coffee and watching him. Then they returned to the motel room, where the brother gave him lessons. Brother Luke had been a math professor before he came to the monastery, but he had wanted to work with children, and so he had later taught sixth grade. But he knew about other subjects as well, history and books and music and languages. He knew so much more than the other brothers, and he wondered why Luke had never taught him when they lived at the monastery. They ate lunch, peanut butter sandwiches again, and then had more classes until 3 p.m. when he was allowed outside again to run around the parking lot or to take a walk with the brother down the highway. The motel faced the interstate, and the whoosh of the passing cars provided a constant soundtrack. It's like living by the sea, Brother Luke always said. After this, Brother Luke made a third pot of coffee and then drove off to look for locations where they'd build their cabin, and he stayed behind in their motel room. The brother always locked him into the room for his safety. Don't open the door for anyone, do you hear me? Asked the brother. Not for anyone. I have a key and I'll let myself in. And don't open the curtains. I don't want anyone to see you're in here alone. There are dangerous people out there in the world. I don't want you to get hurt. It was for the same reason that he wasn't to use Brother Luke's computer which he took with him anyway whenever he left the room. You don't know who's out there, Brother Luke would say. I want you to be safe, Jude. Promise me. He promised. He would lie on his bed and read. The television was forbidden to him. Luke would feel it when he came back to the room to see if it was warm, and he didn't want to displease him. He didn't want to get in trouble. Brother Luke had brought a piano keyboard in his car, and he practiced on it. The brother was never mean to him, but he did take lessons seriously. As the sky grew dark, though, he would find himself sitting on the edge of Brother Luke's bed, pinching back the curtain and scanning the parking lot for Brother Luke's car. Some part of him was always worried that Brother Luke wouldn't return for him after all, that he was growing tired of him, that he would be left alone. There was so much he didn't know about the world, and the world was a scary place. He tried to remind himself that there were things he could do, that he knew how to work, that maybe he could get a job cleaning the motel. But he was always anxious until he saw the station wagon pulling toward him, and then he would be relieved and would promise himself that he would do better the next day, that he would never give Brother Luke a reason to not return to him. One evening, the brother came back to the room looking tired. A few days ago, he had returned excited. He had found the perfect piece of land, he said. He described a clearing surrounded by cedars and pines, a little stream nearby busy with fish, the air so cool and quiet that you could hear every pine cone as it fell to the soft ground. He had even shown him a picture, all dark greens and shadows, and had explained where their cabin would go and how he could help build it, 
and where they would make a sleeping loft, a secret fort, just for him. What's wrong, Brother Luke? He asked him, after the brother had been silent so long that he could no longer stand it. Oh, Jude, said the brother, I failed. He told him how he had tried and tried to buy the land, but he just didn't have the money. I'm sorry, Jude, I'm sorry, he said, and then, to his amazement, the brother began to cry. He had never seen an adult cry. Maybe you could teach again, Brother Luke, he said, trying to comfort him. I like you. If I were a kid, I'd like to be taught by you. And the brother smiled a bit at him and stroked his hair and said it didn't work like that, that he'd have to get licensed by the state, and it was a long and complicated process. He thought and thought, and then he remembered. Brother Luke, he said, I could help. I could get a job. I could help earn money. No, Jude, said the brother. I can't let you do that. But I want to, he said. He remembered Brother Michael telling him how much he cost for the monastery to maintain, and felt guilty and frightened, both. Brother Luke had done so much for him, and he had done nothing in return. He not only wanted to help earn money, he had to. At last he was able to convince the brother, who hugged him. You really are one in a million, you know that? Luke asked him. You really are special. And he smiled into the brother's sweater. The next day they had classes as usual, and then the brother left again. This time, he said, to find him a good job, something he could do that would help them earn money so they could buy the land and build a cabin. And this time Luke returned smiling, excited even, and seeing this, he was excited as well. Jude, said the brother, I met someone who wants to give you some work. He's waiting right outside, and you can start now. He smiled back at the brother. What am I going to do? He asked. At the monastery, he had been taught to sweep and dust and mop. He could wax the floor so well that even Brother Matthew had been impressed. He knew how to polish silver and brass and wood. He knew how to clean between tiles and how to scrub a toilet. He knew how to clean leaves out of gutters and clean and reset a mouse trap. He knew how to wash windows and do laundry by hand. He knew how to iron. He knew how to sew on buttons. He knew how to make stitches so even and fine that they looked as if they had been done by machine. He knew how to cook. He could only make a dozen or so dishes from start to finish, but he knew how to clean and peel potatoes, carrots, rutabaga. He could chop hills of onions and never cry. He could debone a fish and knew how to pluck and clean a chicken. He knew how to make dough. He knew how to make bread. He knew how to whip egg whites until they transformed from liquid to solid to something better than solid, something like air given form. And he knew how to garden. He knew which plants craved sun and which shied from it. He knew how to determine whether a plant was parched or drowning in too much water. He knew when a tree or bush needed to be repotted, and when it was hardy enough to be transferred into the earth. He knew which plants needed to be protected from cold and how to protect them. He knew how to make a clipping and how to make the clipping grow. He knew how to mix fertilizer, how to add eggshells into the soil for extra protein, how to crush an aphid without destroying the leaf it was perched on. He could do all of these things, although he was hoping he would get to garden, because he wanted to work outside. And on his morning runs, he could feel that summer was coming, and on their drives to the track, he had seen fields in bloom with wildflowers, and he wanted to be among them. Brother Luke knelt by him. You're going to do what you did with Father Gabriel and a couple of the brothers, he said. And then, slowly, he understood what Luke was saying, and he stepped back toward the bed, everything within him seizing with fear. Jude, it's going to be different now, Luke said, before he could say anything. It'll be over so fast, I promise you, and you're so good at it, and I'll be waiting in the bathroom to make sure nothing goes wrong, all right? He stroked his hair. Come here, he said, and held him. You are a wonderful kid, he said. It's because of you and what you're doing that we're going to have our cabin, all right? Brother Luke had talked and talked, and finally he had nodded. The man had come in. Many years later, his would be one of the very few of their faces he would remember, and sometimes he would see men on the street and they would look familiar, and he would think, how do I know him? Is he someone I was in court with? Was he the opposing counsel on that case last year? And then he would remember, he looks like the first of them, the first of the clients. And Luke had gone to the bathroom, which was just behind his bed, and he and the man had sex, and the man had left. That night he was very quiet, and Luke was gentle and tender with him. He had even brought him a cookie, a ginger snap, and he had tried to smile at Luke, 
and tried to eat it, but he couldn't. And when Luke wasn't looking, he wrapped it in a piece of paper and threw it away. The next day, he hadn't wanted to go to the track in the morning, but Luke had said he'd feel better with some exercise, and so they had gone and he had tried to run. But it was too painful, and he had eventually sat down and waited until Luke said they could leave. Now their routine was different. They still had classes in the mornings and afternoons, but now, some evenings, Brother Luke brought back men, his clients. Sometimes there was just one, sometimes there were several. The men brought their own towels and their own sheets, which they fitted over the bed before they began and appealed and took with them when they left. He tried very hard not to cry at night, but when he did, Brother Luke would come sit with him and rub his back and comfort him. How many more until we get the cabin? He asked, but Luke just shook his head, sadly. I won't know for a while, he said. But you're doing such a good job, Jude. You're so good at it. It's nothing to be ashamed of. But he knew there was something shameful about it. No one had ever told him there was, but he knew anyway. He knew what he was doing was wrong. And then, after a few months, and many motels, they moved every ten days or so, all around East Texas, and with every move, Luke took him to the forest, which really was beautiful, and to the clearing where they'd have their cabin. Things changed again. He was lying in his bed one night, a night during a week in which there had been no clients. A little vacation, Luke had said, smiling. Everyone needs a break, especially someone who works as hard as you do. When Luke asked, Jude, do you love me? He hesitated. Four months ago, he would have said yes immediately, proudly and unthinkingly. But now, did he love Brother Luke? He often wondered about this. He wanted to. The brother had never hurt him or hit him or said anything mean to him. He took care of him. He was always waiting just behind the wall to make sure nothing bad happened to him. The week before, a client had tried to make him do something Brother Luke said he never had to do if he didn't want to, and he had been struggling and trying to cry out, but there had been a pillow over his face, and he knew his noises were muffled. He was frantic, almost sobbing, when suddenly the pillow had been lifted from his face and the man's weight from his body, and Brother Luke was telling the man to get out of the room in a tone he had never heard from the brother, but which had frightened and impressed him. And yet something else told him that he shouldn't love Brother Luke that the brother had done something to him that was wrong. But he hadn't. He had volunteered for this, after all. It was for the cabin in the woods, where he would have his own sleeping loft, that he was doing this. And so he told the brother he did. He was momentarily happy when he saw the smile on the brother's face, as if he had presented him with the cabin itself. Oh, Jude, he said. That is the greatest gift I could ever get. Do you know how much I love you? I love you more than I love my own self. I think of you like my own son. And he had smiled back, then, because sometimes he had privately thought of Luke as his father, and he as Luke's son. Your dad said you're nine, but you look older, one of the clients had said to him, suspiciously, before they had begun, and he had answered what Luke had told him to say. I'm tall for my age. Both pleased and oddly not pleased that the client had thought Luke was his father. Then Brother Luke had explained to him that when two people loved each other as much as they did, they slept in the same bed and were naked with each other. He hadn't known what to say to this, but before he could think of what it might be, Brother Luke was moving into bed with him and taking off his clothes and then kissing him. He had never kissed before. Brother Luke didn't let the clients do it with him, and he didn't like it, didn't like the wetness and the force of it. Relax, the brother told him. Just relax, Jude. And he tried to as much as he could. The first time the brother had sex with him, he told him it would be different than with the clients. Because we're in love, he'd said, and he had believed him. And when it had felt the same after all, as painful, as difficult, as uncomfortable, as shameful, he assumed he was doing something wrong, especially because the brother was so happy afterward. Wasn't that nice? The brother asked him. Didn't it feel different? And he had agreed, too embarrassed to admit that it had been no different at all, that it had been just as awful as it had been with the client the day before. Brother Luke usually didn't have sex with him if he'd seen clients earlier in the evening, but they always slept in the same bed, and they always kissed. Now one bed was used for the clients, and the other was theirs. He grew to hate the taste of Luke's mouth, its old coffee tang, his tongue something slippery in skin trying to burrow inside of him. Late at night, as the brother lay next to him asleep, pressing him against the wall with his weight, he would sometimes cry, silently, praying to be taken away, anywhere, anywhere else. He no longer thought of the cabin. He now dreamed of the monastery. 
He thought of how stupid he'd been to leave. It had been better there after all. When they were out in the mornings and would pass people, Brother Luke would tell him to lower his eyes because his eyes were distinctive and if the brothers were looking for them, they would give them away. But sometimes he wanted to raise his eyes, as if they could by their very color and shape telegraph a message across miles and states to the brothers, Here I am. Help me. Please take me back. Nothing was his any longer. Not his eyes. Not his mouth. Not even his name, which Brother Luke only called him in private. Around everyone else, he was Joey. And this is Joey, Brother Luke would say, and he would rise from the bed and wait, his head bent, as the client inspected him. He cherished his lessons, because they were the one time Brother Luke didn't touch him, and in those hours, the brother was who he remembered, the person he had trusted and followed. But then the lessons would end for the day, and every evening would conclude the same as the evening before. He grew more and more silent. Where's my smiley boy? The brother would ask him, and he would try to smile back at him. It's okay to enjoy it, the brother would say, sometimes, and he would nod, and the brother would smile at him and rub his back. You like it, don't you? He would ask and wink, and he would nod at him, mutely. I can tell, Luke would say, still smiling, proud of him. You were made for this, Jude. Some of the clients would say that to him as well. You were born for this. And as much as he hated it, he also knew that they were right. He was born for this. He had been born and left and found and used as he had been intended to be used. In later years, he would try to remember when exactly it was that he must have realized that the cabin was never going to be built, that the life he had dreamed of would never be his. When he had begun, he had kept track of the number of clients he had seen, thinking that when he reached a certain number, 40, 50, he would surely be done, he would surely be allowed to stop. But then the number grew larger and larger, until one day he had looked at it and realized how large it was and had started crying, so scared and sick of what he had done that he had stopped counting. So was it when he reached that number? Or was it when they left Texas altogether, Luke promising him that the forests were better in Washington State anyway, and they drove west, through New Mexico and Arizona, and then north, stopping for weeks in little towns, staying in little motels that were the twins of that very first motel they had ever stayed in, and no matter where they stopped, there were always men, and on the nights there weren't men, there was Brother Luke, who seemed to crave him the way he himself had never craved anything. Was it when he realized that he hated his weeks off more than the normal weeks, because the return to his regular life was so much more terrible than if he had never had a vacation at all? Was it when he began noticing the inconsistencies in Brother Luke's stories, how sometimes it wasn't his son but a nephew, who hadn't died but in fact moved away, and Brother Luke never saw him again, or how sometimes he stopped teaching because he had felt calling to join the monastery, and sometimes it was because he was weary from having to constantly negotiate with the school's principal, who clearly didn't care for children the way the brother did, or how in some stories he had grown up in Texas, but in others he had spent his childhood in Carmel, or Laramie, or Eugene, or was it the day that they were passing through Utah to Idaho on their way to Washington? They rarely ventured into actual towns. Their America was denuded of trees, of flowers. Theirs was just long stretches of roadway. The only green thing, Brother Luke's lone surviving, Catalea, which continued to live and leaf, though not bud. But this time they had, because Brother Luke had a doctor friend in one of the towns, and he wanted him to be examined, because it was clear he had picked up some sort of disease from one of the clients, despite the precautions Brother Luke made them take. He didn't know the name of the town, but he was startled at the signs of normalcy, of life around him, and he stared out his window in silence, looking at these scenes that he had always imagined but rarely saw, women standing on the street with strollers, talking and laughing with one another, a jogger panning by, a world made of not just men but also of children and women. Normally on these drives he would close his eyes, he slept all the time now, waiting for each day to end, but this day he felt unusually alert, as if the world was trying to tell him something and all he had to do was listen to its message. Brother Luke was trying to read the map and drive at the same time, and finally he pulled over, studying the map and muttering. Luke had stopped across the street from a baseball field, and he watched as, if at once, it began to fill with people, women mostly, and then, running and shouting, boys. The boys wore uniforms, white with red stripes, but despite that, they all looked different, different hair, different eyes, different skin, some were skinny, like he was, and some were fat. He had never seen so many boys his own age at one time, and he looked and looked at them. And then he noticed that although they were different, they were actually the same. 
They were all smiling and laughing, excited to be outside, in the dry, hot air, the sun bright above them, their mothers unloading cans of soda and bottles of water and juice from plastic carrying containers. Aha! We're back on track, he heard Luke saying, and heard him fold up the map. But before he started the engine again, he felt Luke follow his gaze, and for a moment the two of them sat staring at the boys in silence, until at last Luke stroked his hair. I love you, Jude, he said. And after a moment, he replied as he always did. I love you too, Brother Luke. And they drove away. He was the same as those boys, but he was really not. He was different. He would never be one of them. He would never be someone who would run across a field while his mother called after him to come have a snack before he played so he wouldn't get tired. He would never have his bed in the cabin. He would never be clean again. The boys were playing on the field, and he was driving with Brother Luke to the doctor. The kind of doctor he knew from his previous visits to other doctors would be somehow wrong, somehow not a good person. He was as far away from them as he was from the monastery. He was so far gone from himself, from who he had hoped to be, that it was as if he was no longer a boy at all, but something else entirely. This was his life now, and there was nothing he could do about it. At the doctor's office, Luke leaned over and held him. We're going to have fun tonight, just you and me, he said, and he nodded, because there was nothing else he could do. Let's go, said Luke, releasing him, and he got out of the car and followed Brother Luke across the parking lot and toward the brown door that was already opening to let them inside. The first memory, a hospital room. He knew it was a hospital room even before he opened his eyes because he could smell it, because its quality of silence, a silence that wasn't really silent, was familiar. Next to him, Willem, asleep in a chair. Then he had been confused. Why was Willem here? He was supposed to be away, somewhere. He remembered. Sri Lanka. But he wasn't. He was here. How strange, he thought. I wonder why he's here. That was the first memory. The second memory. The same hospital room. He turned and saw Andy sitting on the side of his bed. Andy, unshaven and awful looking, giving him a strange, unconvincing smile. He felt Andy squeeze his hand. He hadn't realized he had a hand until he felt Andy squeeze it, and had tried to squeeze back, but couldn't. Andy had looked up at someone. Nerve damage? He heard Andy ask. Maybe, said this other person, the person he couldn't see. But if we're lucky, it's more likely it's... And he had closed his eyes and fallen back asleep. That was the second memory. The third and fourth and fifth and sixth memories weren't really memories at all. They were people's faces, their hands, their voices, leaning into his face, holding his hand, talking to him. They were Harold and Julia and Richard and Lucien. Same for the seventh and eighth, Malcolm, J.B., the ninth memory was Willem again, sitting next to him, telling him he was so sorry, but he had to leave, just for a little while, and then he'd be back. He was crying and wasn't sure why, but it didn't seem so unusual. They all cried. They cried and apologized to him, which he found perplexing, as none of them had done anything wrong. He knew that much, at least. He tried to tell Willem not to cry, that he was fine, but his tongue was so thick in his mouth, a great useless slap, and he couldn't make it operate. Willem was already holding one of his hands, but he didn't have the energy to lift the other so he could put it on Willem's arm and reassure him, and finally he had given up. In the tenth memory, he was still in the hospital, but in a different room, and he was still so tired. His arms ached. He had two foam balls, one cupped in each palm, and he was supposed to squeeze them for five seconds and then release them for five. Then squeeze them for five and release them for five. He couldn't remember who had told him this or who had given him the balls, but he did so anyway. Although he, whenever he did, his arms hurt more, a burning, raw pain, and he couldn't do more than three or four repetitions before he was exhausted and had to stop. And then one night he had awoken, swimming up through layers of dreams he couldn't remember and had realized where he was and why. He had gone back to sleep then, but the next day he turned his head and saw a man sitting in a chair next to his bed. He didn't know who the man was, but he had seen him before. He would come and sit and stare at him and sometimes he would talk to him, but he could never concentrate on what the man was saying and would eventually close his eyes. I'm in a mental institution, he told the man now, and his voice sounded wrong to him, reedy and hoarse. The man smiled. You're in the psychiatric wing of a hospital, yes, he said. Do you remember me? No, he said, but I recognize you. I'm Dr. Solomon. I'm a psychiatrist here at the hospital. There was silence. Do you know why you're here? 
He closed his eyes and nodded. Where's Willem? He asked. Where's Harold? Willem had to go back to Sri Lanka to finish shooting, said the doctor. He'll be back. He heard the sound of paper flipping. October 9th. So in ten days. Harold's coming at noon. It's when he's been coming. Do you remember? He shook his head. Jude, the doctor said. Can you tell me why you're here? Because, he began, swallowing, because of what I did in the shower. There was another silence. That's right, said the doctor, softly. Jude, can you tell me why? But that was all he heard, because he had fallen asleep again. The next time he woke, the man was gone, but Harold was in his place. Harold, he said, in his strange new voice, and Harold who had been sitting with his elbows on his thighs and his face in his hands, looked up suddenly as if he'd shouted. Jude, he said, and sat next to him on the bed. He took the ball out of his right hand and replaced it with his own hand. He thought that Harold looked terrible. I'm sorry, Harold, he said, and Harold began to cry. Don't cry, he told him. Please don't cry. And Harold got up and went to the bathroom, and he could hear him blowing his nose. That night, once he was alone, he cried as well. Not because of what he had done, but because he hadn't been successful. Because he had lived, after all. His mind grew a little clearer with every day. Every day he was awake a little longer. Mostly, he felt nothing. People came to him and cried, and he looked at them and could register only the strangeness of their faces, the way everyone looked the same when they cried, their noses hoggy, rarely used muscles pulling their mouths in unnatural directions, into unnatural shapes. He thought of nothing. His mind was a clean sheet of paper. He learned little pieces of what had happened. How Richard's studio manager had thought the plumber was coming at nine that night, not nine the following morning. Even in his haste, he wondered how anyone could think a plumber would come at nine in the evening. How Richard had found him and called an ambulance and had ridden with him to the hospital. How Richard had called Andy and Harold and Willem. How Willem had flown back from Colombo to meet with him. He did feel sorry that it had been Richard who'd had to discover him. That was always the part of the plan that had made him uncomfortable, although at the time he had remembered thinking that Richard had a high tolerance for blood, having once made sculptures with it, and so was the least likely among his friends to be traumatized, and had apologized to Richard, who had stroked the back of his hand and told him it was fine, it was okay. Dr. Solomon came every day and tried to talk to him, but he didn't have much to say. Most of the time, people didn't talk to him at all, they came and sat and did work of their own, or spoke to him without seeming to expect a reply, which he appreciated. Lucienne came often, usually with a gift, once with a large card that everyone in the office had signed. I'm sure this isn't a thing to make you feel better, he'd said, dryly, but here it is, anyway. And Malcolm made him one of his imaginary houses, its windows crisp vellum, which he placed on his bedside table. Willem called him every morning and every night, Harold read The Hobbit to him, which he had never read, and when Harold couldn't come, Julia came and picked up where Harold had left off. Those were his favorite visits. Andy arrived every evening, after visiting hours had ended, and had dinner with him. He was concerned that he wasn't eating enough and brought him a serving of whatever he was having. He brought him a container of beef barley soup, but his hands were still too weak to hold the spoon, and Andy had to feed him, one slow spoonful after the next. Once... This would have embarrassed him, but now he simply didn't care. He opened his mouth and accepted the food, which was flavorless, and chewed and swallowed. I want to go home, he told Andy one evening as he watched Andy eat his turkey club sandwich. Andy finished his bite and looked at him. Oh, do you? Yes, he said. He couldn't think of anything else to say. I want to leave. He thought Andy would say something sarcastic, but he only nodded, slowly. Okay, he said. Okay, I'll talk to Solomon, he grimaced. Eat your sandwich. The next day, Dr. Solomon said, I hear you want to go home. I feel like I've been here for a long time, he said. Dr. Solomon was quiet. You have been here for a little while, he said. But given your history of self-injury and the seriousness of your attempt, your doctor, Andy, and parents thought it was for the best. He thought about this. So if my attempt had been less serious, I could have gone home earlier? It seemed too logical to be an effective policy. The doctor smiled. Probably, he said. 
but I'm not completely opposed to letting you go home, Jude. Although I think we would have to put some protective measures in place. He stopped. It troubles me, however, that you've been so unwilling to discuss why you made the attempt in the first place. Dr. Contractor, I'm sorry, Andy, tells me that you've always resisted therapy. Can you tell me why? He said nothing, and neither did the doctor. Your father tells me you were in an abusive relationship last year, and that it had long-term reverberations, said the doctor, and he felt himself go cold. But he willed himself not to answer, and closed his eyes, and finally he could hear Dr. Solomon get up to leave. I'll be back tomorrow, Jude, he said as he left. Eventually, once it was clear that he wasn't going to speak to any of them, and that he was in no state to hurt himself again, they let him go, with stipulations. He was to be released into Julia and Harold's care. It was strongly recommended that he remain on a milder course of the drugs that he'd been given in the hospital. It was very strongly recommended that he see a therapist twice a week. He was to see Andy once a week. He was to take a sabbatical from work, which had already been arranged. He agreed to everything. He signed his name, the pen wobbly in his grip, on the discharge papers, under Andy's and Dr. Suleiman's and Harold's. Harold and Julia took him to Truro, where Willem was already waiting for him. Every night he slept extravagantly, and during the day he and Willem walked slowly downhill to the ocean. It was early October and too cold to get into the water, but they would sit on the sand and look out at the horizon line, and sometimes Willem would talk to him and sometimes he wouldn't. He dreamed that the sea had turned into a solid block of ice, its waves frozen in mid-crest, and that Willem was at a far shore, beckoning to him, and he was making his way slowly across its wide expanse to him, his hands and face numb from the wind. They ate dinner early, because he went to bed so early. The meals were always something simple, easy to digest, and if there was meat, one of the three of them would cut it up for him in advance so he wouldn't have to try to wield a knife. Harold poured him a glass of milk every dinner, as if he was a child, and he drank it. He wasn't allowed to leave the table until he had eaten at least half of what was on his plate, and wasn't allowed to serve himself either. He was too tired to fight this. He did the best he could. He was always cold and sometimes he woke in the middle of the night, shivering despite the covers heaped on top of him, and would lie there, watching Willem, who was sharing his room, breathing on the couch opposite him. Watching clouds drift across the slice of moon, he could see between the edge of the window frame and the blind, until he was able to sleep again. Sometimes he thought about what he had done and felt that same sorrow he felt in the hospital, the sorrow that he had failed, that he was still alive, and sometimes he thought about it and felt dread, now everyone really would treat him differently. Now he really was a freak, a bigger freak than he'd been before. Now he would have to begin anew in his attempts to convince people he was normal. He thought of the office, the one place where what had been hadn't mattered. But now there would always be another, competing story about him. Now he wouldn't just be the youngest equity partner in the firm's history, as Tremaine sometimes introduced him. Now he would be the partner who had tried to kill himself. They must be furious with him, he thought. He thought of his work there and wondered who was handling it. They probably didn't even need him to come back. Who would want to work with him again? Who would trust him again? And it wasn't just Rose and Pritchard who would see him differently. It was everyone. All the autonomy he had spent years accumulating, trying to prove to everyone that he deserved. Now it was gone. Now he couldn't even cut his own food. The day before, Willem had had to help him tie his shoes. It'll get better, Judy, he said to him. It'll get better. The doctor said it's just going to take time. In the mornings, Harold or Willem had to shave him because his hands were still too unsteady. He looked at his unfamiliar face in the mirror as they dragged a razor down his cheeks and under his chin. He had taught himself how to shave in Philadelphia when he was living with the Douglases, but Willem had retaught him their freshman year, alarmed, he later told him, by his tentative, hacking movements, as if he was clearing brush with a scythe. Good at calculus, bad at shaving he said then, and had smiled at him so he wouldn't feel more self-conscious. Then he would tell himself, you can always try again. And just thinking that made him feel stronger, although perversely, he was somehow less inclined to try again. He was too exhausted. Trying again meant preparation. It meant finding something sharp, finding some time alone, and he was never alone. Of course, he knew there were other methods, but he remained stubbornly fixated on the one he had chosen, even though it hadn't worked. Mostly, though, he felt nothing. Harold and Julia and Willem asked him what he wanted for breakfast, but the choices were impossible and overwhelming. Pancakes? Waffles? Cereal? Eggs? What kind of eggs? 
soft boiled, hard, scrambled, sunny side, fried, over easy, poached, and he'd shaken his head and they eventually stopped asking. They stopped asking his opinion on anything, which he found restful. After lunch, also absurdly early, he napped on the living room sofa in front of the fire, falling asleep to the sound of their murmurs, the slosh of water as they did the dishes. In the afternoons, Harold read to him. Sometimes Willem and Julia stayed to listen as well. After ten days or so, he and Willem went home to Green Street. He had been dreading his return, but when he went to his bathroom, the marble was clean and stainless. Malcolm, said Willem, before he had to ask. He finished last week. It's all new. Willem helped him into bed and gave him a manila envelope with his name on it, which he opened after Willem left. Inside were the letters he had written everyone, still sealed, and a sealed copy of his will, and a note from Richard. I thought you would want these. Love, R. He slid them back into the envelope, his hands shaking. The next day, he put them in his safe. The next morning, he woke very early, creeping past Willem sleeping on the sofa at the far end of his bedroom, and walked through the apartment. Someone had put flowers in every room, or branches of maple leaves, or bowls of squashes. The space smelled delicious, like apples and cedar. He went to his study, where someone had stacked his mail on his desk, and where Malcolm's little paper house sat atop a stack of books. He saw unopened envelopes from JB, from Asian Henry Young, from India, from Ali, and knew that they had made drawings for him. He walked past the dining room table, letting his fingers skim along the spines of the books lined up on their shelves. He wandered into the kitchen and opened the refrigerator and saw that it was filled with things he liked. Richard had started working more with ceramics, and at the center of the dining table was a large, amorphous piece, the glaze rough and pleasant under his palms, painted with white thread-like veins. Next to it stood his and Willem's St. Jude statue, which Willem had taken with him when he moved to Perry Street, but which had now found its way back to him. The day slipped by and he let them. In the morning he swam, and he and Willem ate breakfast. The physical therapist came and had him practice squeezing rubber balls, short lengths of rope, toothpicks, pens, Sometimes he had to pick up multiple objects with one hand, holding them between his fingers, which was difficult. His hands shook more than ever, and he felt sharp prickles vibrating through his fingers, but she told him not to worry, that it was his muscles repairing themselves, his nerves resetting themselves. He had lunch. He napped. While he napped, Richard came to watch him and Willem went out to run errands and go downstairs to the gym and, he hoped, do something interesting and indulgent that didn't involve him and his problems. People came to see him in the afternoon, all the same people, and new people, too. They stayed an hour, and then Willem made them leave. Malcolm came with JB, and the four of them had an awkward, polite conversation about things they had done when they were in college. But he was glad to see JB, and thought he might like to see him again when he was less cloudy-headed, so he could apologize to him and tell him he forgave him. As he was leaving, JB told him, quietly, It'll get better, Judy. Trust me, I know and then added, at least you didn't hurt anyone in the process. And he felt guilty, because he knew he had. Andy came at the end of the day and examined him. He unwrapped his bandages and cleaned the area around his stitches. He still hadn't looked at his stitches. He couldn't bring himself to. And when Andy was cleaning them, he looked elsewhere or closed his eyes. After Andy left, they ate dinner, and after dinner, after the boutiques and few remaining galleries had shuttered for the night and the neighborhood was deserted, they walked making a neat square around Soho, east to Lafayette, north to Houston, west to Sixth, south to Grand, east to Green, before returning home. It was a short walk, but it left him exhausted, and he once fell on the way to the bedroom, his legs simply sliding out from beneath him. Julia and Harold took the train down on Thursdays and spent all day Friday and Saturday with him, and part of Sunday as well. Every morning, Willem asked him, Do you want to talk to Dr. Loman today? And every morning, he answered, Not yet, Willem. Soon. I promise. By the end of October, he was feeling stronger, less shaky. He was managing to stay awake for longer stretches at a time. He could lie on his back and hold a book up without trembling so badly that he had to roll over onto his stomach so he could prop it against a pillow. He could butter his own bread, and he could wear shirts with buttons again because he was able to slip the button into its hole. What are you reading? He asked Willem one afternoon sitting next to him on the living room couch. A play I'm thinking of doing, Willem said, putting the pages down. He looked at a point beyond Willem's head. Are you going away again? It was monstrously selfish to ask, 
but he couldn't stop himself. No, said Willem, after a silence. I thought I'd stick around New York for a while, if that's okay with you. He smiled at the couch cushions. It's fine with me, he said, and looked up to see Willem smiling at him. It's nice to see you smile again, was all he said, and went back to reading. In November, he realized that he'd had done nothing to celebrate Willem's 43rd birthday in late August, and mentioned it to him. Well, technically, you get a pass, because I wasn't here, said Willem. But sure, I'll let you make it up to me. Let's see. He thought. Are you ready to go out into the world? Do you want to have dinner? An early dinner? Sure, he said. And they went the next week to a little Japanese place in the East Village that served pressed sushi where they'd been going for years. He ordered his own food, although he had been nervous, worried that he was somehow choosing incorrectly. But Willem was patient and waited as he deliberated. And when he had decided, he nodded at him. Good choice, he said. As they ate, they spoke of their friends and the play Willem had decided he was going to do, and the novel he was reading. Anything but him. I think we should go to Morocco he said as they walked slowly home, and Willem looked at him. I'll look into it, Willem said, and took his arm to move him out of the path of a bicyclist who was zooming down the street. I want to get you something for your birthday, he said, a few blocks later. Really, he wanted to get Willem something to thank him, and to try to express what he couldn't say to him, a gift that would properly convey years of gratitude and love. After their earlier conversation about the play, he had remembered that Willem had, in fact, committed the previous year to a project that would be a shooting in Russia in early January. But when he mentioned this to him, Willem had shrugged. Oh, that? He'd asked. Didn't work out. It's fine. I didn't really want to do it anyway. He had been suspicious, though. And when he had looked online, there were reports that Willem had pulled out of the film for personal reasons. Another actor had been cast instead. He had stared at the screen then, the story blurring before him. But when he had asked Willem about it, Willem had shrugged again. That's what you say when you realize you and the director really aren't on the same page and no one wants to lose face, he said. But he knew that Willem wasn't telling him the truth. You don't need to get me anything, Willem said, as he knew he would, and he said, as he always did, I know I don't need to, but I want to. And then he added, also as he always did, a better friend would know what to get you and wouldn't have to ask for suggestions. A better friend would, Willem agreed, as he always did, and he smiled because it felt like one of their normal conversations. More days passed. Willem moved back into his suite at the other end of the apartment. Lucien called him a few times to ask him about one thing or another, apologizing as he did, but he was happy to get his calls and happy that Lucien now began their conversations by complaining about a client or colleague instead of asking how he was. Aside from Tremaine and Lucien and one or two other people, no one at the firm knew the real reason he'd been absent. They, like his clients, had been told he was recovering from an emergency spinal cord surgery. He knew that when he returned to Rosen Pritchard, Lucien would immediately restart him on his normal caseload. There would be no talk of giving him an easy transition, no speculation about his ability to handle stress, and he was grateful for that. He stopped taking his drugs, which he realized were making him feel dopey. And after they had left his system, he was amazed by how clear he felt. Even his vision was different, as if a plate glass window had been wiped clean of all grease and smears and he was finally getting to admire the brilliant green lawn beyond it, the pear trees with their yellow fruit. But he also realized that the drugs had been protecting him, and without them, the hyenas returned, less numerous and more sluggish, but still circling him, following him, less motivated in their pursuit but still there, his unwanted but dog companions. Other memories came back to him as well, the same old ones, but new ones too, and he was made much more sharply aware of how severely he had inconvenienced everyone, of how much he had asked from people, of how he had taken what he would never, ever be able to repay. And then there was the voice, which whispered to him at odd moments, you can try again, you can try again. And he tried to ignore it, because at some point, in the same undefinable way that he had decided to kill himself in the first place, he had decided he would work on getting better, and he didn't want to be reminded that he could try again, that being alive, as ignominious and absurd as it often was, wasn't his only option. Thanksgiving came, which they once again had at Harold and Julia's apartment on West End Avenue, and which was once again a small group. Lawrence and Gillian, their daughters had gone to their husband's family's house for the holiday. Him, Willem, Richard in India, Malcolm and Sophie. At the meal, he could feel everyone trying not to pay too much attention to him, 
and when Willem mentioned the trip they were taking to Morocco in the middle of December, Harold was so relaxed, so incurious, that he knew that he must have already thoroughly discussed it with Willem, and probably Andy, in advance, and given his permission. When do you go back to Rose and Pritchard? asked Lawrence, as if he'd been away on holiday. January 3rd, he said. So soon, said Gillian. He smiled back at her. Not soon enough, he said. He meant it. He was ready to try to be normal again, to make another attempt at being alive. He and Willem left early, and that evening he cut himself for the second time since he was released from the hospital. This was another thing the drugs had dampened, his need to cut, to feel that bright, startling slap of pain. The first time he did it, he was shocked by how much it hurt, and had actually wondered why he had been doing this to himself for so long. What had he been thinking? But then he felt everything within him slow, felt himself relax, felt his memories dim, and had remembered how it helped him, remembered why he had begun doing it at all. These scars from his attempt were three vertical lines on both arms, from the base of his palm to just below the inside of his elbow, and they hadn't healed well. It looked as if he had shoved pencils just beneath the skin. They had a strange, pearly shine, almost as if the skin had been burned, and now he made a fist, watching them tighten in response. That night he woke screaming, which had been happening as he readjusted to life, to an existence with dreams. On the drugs, there were no dreams, not really, or if there were, they were so strange and pointless and meandering that he soon forgot them. But in this dream, he was in one of the motel rooms, and there was a group of men, and they were grabbing at him, and he was desperate, trying to fight them, but they kept multiplying, and he knew he would lose, he knew he would be destroyed. One of the men kept calling his name, and then put his hand on his cheek, and for some reason that made him more terrified, and he pushed his hand away, and then the man poured water on him and he woke, gasping, to see Willem next to him, his face pale, holding a glass in his hand. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Willem said. I couldn't get you out of it, Jude, I'm sorry. I'm going to get you a towel. And came back with a towel, and the glass filled with water, but he was shaking too badly to hold it. He apologized again and again to Willem, who shook his head and told him not to worry, that it was all right, that it was just a dream. Willem got him a new shirt and turned around as he changed and then took the wet one to the bathroom. Who's brother Luke? asked Willem as they sat there together in silence and waited for his breathing to return to normal. And then when he didn't answer, you kept screaming, help me, brother Luke, help me. He was quiet. Who is he, Jude? Was he someone from the monastery? I can't, Willem, he said, and he yearned for Anna. Ask me one more time, Anna, he said to her, and I'll tell you. Teach me how to do it. This time I'll listen. This time I'll talk. That weekend, they went to Richard's house upstate and took a long walk through the woods that backed the property. Later, he successfully completed the first meal he'd cooked since he was released. He made Willem's favorite, lamb chops, and although he needed Willem's help carving the chop itself, he still wasn't agile enough to do it on his own. He did everything else by himself. That night he woke again, screaming, and again there was Willem, though without the glass of water this time, and him asking about Brother Luke, and why he kept begging for his help, and again, he wasn't able to answer. The next day he was tired, and his arms ached, and his body ached as well, and on their walk, he said very little, and Willem didn't say much himself. In the afternoon they received their plans for Morocco. They would begin in Fes, and then drive through the desert, where they'd stay near Ursaset, and then in Marrakesh. On their way back, they'd stop in Paris to visit Citizen and a friend of Willem's for a few days. They'd be home just before the new year. As they were eating dinner, Willem said, You know, I thought of what you could give me for my birthday. Oh, he said, relieved to be able to concentrate on something he could give Willem, rather than having to ask Willem for yet more help, thinking of all the time he had stolen from him. Let's hear it. Well, said Willem, it's kind of a big thing. Anything, he said. I mean it. And Willem gave him a look he couldn't quite interpret. Really? He assured him. Anything. Willem put down his lamb sandwich and took a breath. Okay, he said. What I really want for my birthday is for you to tell me who Brother Luke is. And not just who he is, but what your, your relationship with him was. And why you think you keep calling out his name at night. He looked at him. I want you to be honest and thorough and tell me the whole story. That's what I want. There was a long silence. He realized he still had a mouthful of food, and he somehow swallowed it, and put down his sandwich as well, 
which he was still holding aloft. Willem, he said at last, because he knew that Willem was serious and that he wouldn't be able to dissuade him, to convince him to wish for something else. Part of me does want to tell you, but if I do, he stopped. But if I do, I'm afraid you're going to be disgusted by me. Wait, he said. As Willem began to speak, he looked at Willem's face. I promise you I will. I promise you. But, but you're going to have to give me some time. I've never really discussed it before, and I need to figure out how to say the words. Okay, Willem said at last. Well, he paused. How about if we work up to it, then? I ask you about something easier, and you answer that. And you'll see that it's not so bad, talking about it. And if it is, we'll discuss that, too. He inhaled, exhaled. This is Willem. He reminded himself, he would never hurt you. Not ever. It's time. It's time. Okay, he said, finally. Okay, ask me. He could see Willem leaning back in his chair and staring at him, trying to determine which to choose of the hundred of questions that one friend should be able to ask another, and yet he had never been allowed to do. Tears came to his eyes, then, for how lopsided he had let their friendship become, and for how long Willem had stayed with him, year after year, even when he had fled from him, even when he had asked for help with problems whose origins he wouldn't reveal. In his new life, he promised himself he would be less demanding of his friends, he would be more generous, Whatever they wanted, he would give them. If Willem wanted information, he would have it. And it was up to him to figure out how to give it to him. He would be hurt again and again, everyone was. But if he was going to try, if he was going to be alive, he had to be tougher. He had to prepare himself. He had to accept that this was part of the bargain of life itself. Okay, I've got one, Willem said. And he sat up straighter, readying himself. How did you get the scar on the back of your hand? He blinked surprised. He wasn't sure what the question was going to be, but now that it had come, he was relieved. He rarely thought of the scar these days, and now he looked at it. It's to fed a gleam, and as he ran his fingertips across it, he thought of how the scar led to so many other problems, and then to Brother Luke, and then to the home, and to Philadelphia, to all of it. But what in life wasn't connected to some greater, sadder story? All Willem was asking for was this one story. He didn't need to drag everything else behind it, a huge ugly snarl of difficulties. He thought about how he could start and plotted what he'd say in his head before he opened his mouth. Finally, he was ready. I was always a greedy kid, he began, and across the table, he watched Willem lean forward on his elbows as for the first time in their friendship, he was the listener and he was being told a story. He was 10, he was 11. His hair grew long again, longer even than it had been at the monastery. He grew taller, and Brother Luke took him to a thrift store where you could buy a sack of clothes and pay by the pound. Slow down! Brother Luke would joke with him, pushing down on the top of his head as if he were squashing him back into a smaller size. You're growing up too fast for me. He slept all the time now. In his lessons, he was awake, but as the day turned to late afternoon, he would feel something descend upon him and would begin yawning, unable to keep his eyes open. At first, Brother Luke joked about this as well. My sleepy head he said, my dreamer. But one night, he sat down with him after the client had left. For months, years, he had struggled with the clients, more out of reflex than because he thought he was capable of making them stop, but recently, he had begun to simply lie there, inert, waiting for whatever was going to happen to be over. I know you're tired, Brother Luke had said. It's normal. You're growing. It's tiring work, growing. And I know you work hard. But Jude, when you're with your clients, you have to show a little life. They're paying to be with you, you know. You have to show them you're enjoying it. When he said nothing, the brother added, Of course, I know it's not enjoyable for you. Not the way it is with just us. We have to show a little energy, all right? He leaned over, tucked his hair behind his ear. All right? He nodded. It was also around then that he began throwing himself into the walls. The motel they were staying in, this was in Washington, had a second floor, and once he had gone upstairs to refill their bucket of ice, it had been a wet, slippery day, and as he was walking back, he had tripped and fallen, bouncing the entire way downstairs. Brother Luke had heard the noise his fall made and had run out. Nothing had been broken, but he had been scraped and was bleeding, and Brother Luke had canceled the appointment he had for that evening. That night, the brother had been careful with him, 
and had brought him tea, but he had felt more alive than he had in weeks. Something about the fall, the freshness of the pain, had been restorative. It was honest pain, clean pain, a pain without shame or filth, and it was a different sensation than he had felt in years. The next week, he went to get ice again, but this time, on his way back to the room, he stopped in a little triangle of space beneath the stairwell, and before he was conscious of what he was doing, he was tossing himself against a brick wall, and as he did so, he imagined he was knocking out himself every piece of dirt, every trace of liquid, every memory of the past few years. He was resetting himself. He was returning himself to something pure. He was punishing himself for what he had done. After that, he felt better, energized, as if he had run a very long race and then had vomited, and he had been able to return to the room. Eventually, however, Brother Luke realized what he was doing, and there had been another talk. I understand you get frustrated, Brother Luke said. But Jude, what you're doing isn't good for you. I'm worried about you, and the clients don't like seeing you all bruised. They were silent. A month ago, after a very bad night, there had been a group of men, and after they had left, he had sobbed, wailed, coming as close to a tantrum as he had in years while Luke sat next to him and rubbed his sore stomach and held a pillow over his mouth to muffle the sound. He had begged Luke to let him stop, and the brother had cried and said he would, that there was nothing more he'd like than for it to be just the two of them, but he had long ago spent all his money taking care of him. I don't regret it for an instant, Jude, said the brother, but we don't have any money now. You're all I've got. I'm so sorry, but I'm really saving now. Eventually, you'll be able to stop, I promise. When? He had sobbed. Soon, said Luke. Soon, a year, I promise. And he had nodded, although he had long since learned that the brother's promises were meaningless. But then the brother said that he would teach him a secret, something that would help him relieve his frustrations, and the next day he had taught him to cut himself, and had given him a bag already packed with razors and alcohol wipes and cotton and bandages. You'll have to experiment to see what feels best, the brother had said and had shown him how to clean and bandage the cut once he had finished. So this is yours, he said, giving him the bag. You'll let me know when you need more supplies, and I'll get them for you. He had at first missed the theatrics, the force and weight of his falls and his slams, but he soon grew to appreciate the secrecy, the control of the cuts. Brother Luke was right. The cutting was better. When he did it, it was as if he was draining away the poison, the filth, the rage inside him. It was as if his old dream of leeches had come to life and had the same effect, the effect he had always hoped it would. He wished he was made of metal, of plastic, something that could be hosed down and scrubbed clean. He had a vision of himself being pumped full of water and detergent and bleach and then blasted dry, everything inside him made hygienic again. Now, after the final client of the night had left, he took Brother Luke's place in the bathroom, and until he heard the brother telling him it was time to come to bed, his body was his to do with what he chose. He was so dependent on Luke, for his food, for his protection, and now for his racers. When he needed to be taken to the doctor because he was sick, he got infections from the clients, no matter how hard Brother Luke tried, and sometimes he didn't properly clean his cuts and they became infected as well. Brother Luke took him, and got him the antibiotics he needed. He grew accustomed to Brother Luke's body, his mouth, his hands. He didn't like them, but he no longer jolted when Luke began to kiss him, and when the brother put his arms around him, he obediently returned the embrace. He knew there was no one else who would ever treat him as well as Luke did. Even when he did something wrong, Luke never yelled at him. And even after all these years, he had still never hit him. Earlier, he thought he might someday have a client who would be better, who might want to take him away, but now he knew that would never be the case. Once, he had started getting undressed before the client was ready, and the man had slapped his face and snapped at him. Jesus, he said. Slow down, you little slut. How many times have you done this, anyway? And as he always did whenever the clients hit him, Luke had come out of the bathroom to yell at the man, and had made the man promise to behave better if he was going to stay. The clients called him names. He was a slut, a whore, filthy, disgusting, a nympho, he had to look that one up, a slave, garbage, trash, dirty, worthless, a nothing. But Luke never said any of those things to him. He was perfect, said Luke. He was smart. He was good at what he did, and there was nothing wrong with what he did. The brothers still talked of their being together, although now he talked of a house on the sea, somewhere in central California, and would describe the stony beaches, the noisy birds, the storm-colored water. They would be together, the two of them, like a married couple. 
No longer were they father and son. Now they were equals. When he turned 16, they would get married. They would go on a honeymoon to France and Germany, where he could finally use his languages around real French and Germans, and to Italy and Spain, where Brother Luke had lived for two years, once as a student, once the year after he graduated college. They would buy him a piano so he could play and sing. Other people won't want you if they knew how many clients you've been with, the brother said. And they'd be silly not to want you, but I'll always want you, even if you've been with 10,000 clients. He would retire when he was 16, Brother Luke said, and he had cried then, quietly, because he had been counting the days until he was 12, when Brother Luke had promised he could stop. Sometimes Luke apologized for what he had to do, when the client was cruel, when he was in pain, when he bled or was bruised, and sometimes Luke acted as if he enjoyed it. Well, that was a good one, he'd say, after one of the men left. I could tell you liked that one, am I right? Don't deny it, Jude. I heard you enjoying yourself. Well, it's good. It's good to enjoy your work. He turned 12. They were now in Oregon, working their way toward California, Luke said. He had grown again. Brother Luke predicted he would be six foot one, six foot two when he stopped, still shorter than Brother Luke, but not by much. His voice was changing. He wasn't a child anymore, and this made finding clients more difficult. Now there were fewer individual clients and more groups. He hated the groups but Luke said that it was the best he could do. He looked too old for his age. Clients thought he was 13 or 14. And at this age, Luke said, every year counted. It was fall, September 20th. They were in Montana because Luke thought he would like to see the night sky there, the stars as bright as electrical lights. There was nothing strange about that day. Two days earlier, he'd had a large group, and it had been so awful that Luke had not only cancelled his clients for the day after, but had let him sleep alone for both nights, the bed completely his. That evening, though, life had returned to normal. Luke joined him in bed and began kissing him, and then, as they were having sex, there was a banging at their door, so loud and insistent and sudden that he had almost bitten down on Brother Luke's tongue. Police! He could hear. Open up! Open up right now! Brother Luke had clamped his hand over his mouth. Don't say a word, he hissed. Police, shouted the voice again. Edgar Wilmot, we have a warrant for your arrest. Open the door right now. He was confused. Who was Edgar Wilmot? Was he a client? He was about to tell Brother Luke that he had made a mistake when he looked up and saw his face and realized that they were looking for Brother Luke. Brother Luke pulled out of him and motioned for him to stay in the bed. Don't move, he whispered. I'll be right back. And then he ran into the bathroom. He could hear the door lock click. No, he'd whispered wildly as Luke left him. Don't leave me, Brother Luke, don't leave me. But the brother had left anyway. And then everything seemed to move very slowly and very fast, both at the same time. He hadn't moved. He had been too petrified. But then there was the splintering of wood, and the room was filled with men holding flashlights high by their heads so that he couldn't see their faces. One of them came over to him and said something to him. He couldn't hear for the noise, for his panic, and pulled up his underwear and helped him to his feet. You're safe now, someone told him. He heard one of the men swear and shout from the bathroom, Get an ambulance right now! And he wrestled free from the man who was holding him and ducked under another man's arm and made three fast leaps to the bathroom, where he had seen Brother Luke with an extension cord around his neck, hanging from the hook in the center of the bathroom ceiling, his mouth open, his eyes shut, his face as gray as his beard. He had screamed, then, screamed and screamed, and then he was being dragged from the room, screaming Brother Luke's name again and again. He remembers little of what followed. He was questioned again and again. He was taken to a doctor at a hospital who examined him and asked him how many times he had been raped, but he hadn't been able to answer him. Had he been raped? He had agreed to this, to all of this. It had been his decision, and he had made it. How many times have you had sex? The doctor asked instead, and he said, With Brother Luke, or with the others? And the doctor had said, What others? And after he had finished telling him, the doctor had turned away from him and put his face in his hands and then looked back at him and had opened his mouth to say something, but nothing came out. And then he knew for certain that what he had been doing was wrong, and he felt so ashamed, so dirty that he wanted to die. They took him to the home. They brought him his things, his books, the Navajo doll, the stones and twigs and acorns and the Bible with its pressed flowers he had carried with him from the monastery, his clothes that the other boys made fun of. At the home, 
They knew what he was. They knew what he had done. They knew he was ruined already. And so he wasn't surprised when some of the counselors began doing to him what people had been doing to him for years. Somehow, the other boys also knew what he was. They called him names. The same names the clients had called him. They left him alone. When he approached a group of them, they would get up and run away. They hadn't brought him his bag with racers, and so he had learned to improvise. He stole an aluminum can lid from the trash can and sterilized it over a glass flame one afternoon when he was on the kitchen duty and used that, stuffing it under his mattress. He stole a new lid every week. He thought of Brother Luke every day. At the school, he skipped four grades. They allowed him to attend classes in math, in piano, in English literature, in French and German at the community college. His teachers asked him who had taught him what he knew, and he said his father had. He did a good job, his English teacher told him. He must have been an excellent teacher. And he had been unable to respond, and she had eventually moved on to the next student. At night, when he was with the counselors, he pretended that Brother Luke was standing right behind the wall, waiting to spring out in case things got too awful, which meant that everything that was happening to him were things Brother Luke knew he could bear. After he had come to trust Anna, he told her a few things about Brother Luke, but he was unwilling to tell her everything. He told no one. He had been a fool to follow Luke, he knew that. Luke had lied to him. He had done terrible things to him. But he wanted to believe that, through everything, in spite of everything, Luke really had loved him. That that part had been real. Not a perversion. Not a rationalization. But real. He didn't think he could take on a saying as she did of the others. He was a monster, Jude. They say they love you. But they say that so they can manipulate you. Don't you see? This is what pedophiles do. This is how they prey on children. As an adult, he was still unable to decide what he thought about Luke. Yes, he was bad. But was he worse than the other brothers? Had he really made the wrong decision? Would it really have been better if he had stayed at the monastery? Would he have been more or less damaged by his time there? Luke's legacies were in everything he did, in everything he was. His love of reading, of music, of math, of gardening, of languages. Those were Luke. His cutting... His hatred, his shame, his fears, his diseases, his inability to have a normal sex life, to be a normal person. Those were Luke, too. Luke had taught him how to find pleasure in life, and he had removed pleasure absolutely. He was careful never to say his name aloud, but sometimes he thought it, and no matter how old he got, no matter how many years had passed, there would appear Luke's face, smiling, conjured in an instant. He thought of Luke when the two of them were falling in love when he was being seduced and had been too much of a child, too naive, too lonely and desperate for affection to know it. He was running to the greenhouse. He was opening the door. The heat and smell of the flowers were surrounding him like a cape. It was the last time he had been so simply happy, the last time he had known such uncomplicated joy. And there's my beautiful boy, Luke would cry. Oh, Jude, I'm so happy to see you.